So, as we previously saw in some uh, previous films, having uh, an exit as a required component of investment strategy is uh, one of the characteristics of private equity investment which makes it unique as an asset class, something very specific to private equity. So it's not a matter of choice for the fund manager. He can only have a sustainable fund by driving uh, a regular flow of exits from his fund or his group of funds. Because LPs and investors are expecting to see successful exits and will make that a condition for the continued support of the fund manager. Funds are organised as limited partnerships, so they have a set life. And by the end of that life, the investments need to be liquidated. And so, in order to have a business that's actually sustainable, a fund manager needs to periodically raise a new fund. And in order to be able to raise new funds, he needs successful exits to show his LPs. So, in other words, exits are a matter of survival. Uh, usually, fund managers who that fail to deliver exits can survive for a bit longer with their existing funds, but they'll find it very difficult to raise a new fund in due course. So basically, a fund manager is on the clock. He needs an exit after three, five, seven years from the investment day, and he needs a successful exit at a higher price than he paid. So the actions that will create value need to be implemented within that time. And this, in, in good practice, will result in a disciplined approach to investment management with milestones as we saw in our discussion of uh, portfolio management. So let's now um, look at the different exit options that are available to private equity investors. The first one is the trade sale. This is where the uh, private equity investor sells to a company operating in the same or a related sector to the portfolio company. The acquirer typically is interested in buying the portfolio company once it's acquired a certain level of maturity or size a critical market mass, and a proper management and governance structure. Some companies may be acquired early, for example, for their product or intellectual property, but this uh, specific uh, variation is mainly confined to the tech area. The acquiring company or, or usually also wants to buy 100% or at least a majority so that he can integrate and consolidate their portfolio company within his operations. A trade sale has traditionally been the primary exit in private equity, especially in uh, regions of the world where IPOs uh, are not available. The pros of a trade sale are that uh, a total exit is possible, the buyer will pay a full price due to so-called M&A synergies. It can also be possible to set up a competitive bidding process among buyers to maximise value. The cons are that the management may not like the choice of buyer, that you need to be able to acquire, offer a majority stake, or that a high profile transaction may require regulatory approvals or attract political attention, especially so in emerging markets. The second exit method is through a stock market exit via initial public offering or some other form of private placement. This requires the involvement of an underwriter. The pros of stock market exit are that it is possible to sell a minority stake, that you do not depend on the sector players to be interested and acquisitive in that particular time. It can be an opportunistic exit, ta exit taking advantage of a market boom with lots of demand. The cons of this option are that it depends on market conditions, obviously. If these are poor, it will simply not be possible to proceed. In some markets, in the world, these are too shallow for this to ever be a viable option, particularly emerging markets. A last disadvantage of IPOs is the lockup period, whereby the underwriters will require the fund to keep a major part of their stake for a period in order not to flood the market with too many shares. From the company's point of view, the pros of listing are access to a new investor base, a raising of profile, the cons are a more onerous reporting regime and regulation and a shift to, towards having to deliver periodic earnings rather than operating medium term as before. The third exit type is the sale to another private equity fund or financial type investor. This route has developed very much over the last 10 years. Prior to that, it was considered by LPs as something not very transparent and open to question. Now, as the private equity industry has evolved, uh, secondary exits, as they are called, 
have established themselves as a major exit route. Some funds even specialise in buying companies just a couple of years before they are ready for IPO or trade sale because this may be due perhaps to market conditions or lack of acquisition in the sector. These funds then simply wait for conditions to change and then sell. The fund they bought from is perhaps in a hurry to exit for their own reasons, such as raising a new fund, and was therefore willing to sell a bit earlier. The pros of a secondary deal are more flexibility and timing, the ability to sell a minority stake, the possibility to sell even when the company has outstanding issues that, re that would require more ironing out before a trade sale or an IPO. There are really no significant disadvantages to a secondary exit. The fourth and final exit route is a structured exit in which the fund sells its shares to the other shareholders or the company. Typically a mechanism such as a put option would be used and it would most likely involve the company leveraging itself to raise the money to buy out the private equity investor. The pros of this exit route are that it can be prearranged in detail at the time of investment and is thus uh, a more certain exit route which uh, does not depend upon third parties or market conditions. The cons of this exit route are that returns tend to be significantly lower and there may be problems with formula-based pricing arrangements, which uh, may lead themselves to manipulation. The other disadvantage may be that if the company is not successful, it may not be able to raise the money to buy out the private equity investor. Structured exits uh, are often used in markets where other types of exits options are more limited, or sometimes as a plan B exit, if the hope for trade sale or IPO do not materialise. So given the fundamental importance of the exit in private equity, let's see what private equity investors do to make sure the companies they invest in are exitable. When uh, initially screening a potential investment, one of the criteria they will apply will actually be whether the company is exitable, irrespective of the company's attraction. There may be great investments which are not exitable, in which case the private equity investor will simply pass, or should simply pass. Not all do. Typically a company is more exitable when there is consolidation and M&A activity in the sector, or the company's sector is attractive to the stock market. So when structuring a deal, the private equity investor will make use of investment instruments which make the investment easier to exit. The most important of these is the drag-along and tag-along right, which we discuss in other films. These rights allow the private equity investor, who may even have a minority stake, to effectively offer a potential buyer a majority stake or even a 100% stake, which is very important for trade buyers, for example. This will have the effect of increasing the universe of potential buyers. The other investment instruments will be options or other mechanisms which create a structured exit, as we saw just a minute ago. The most uh, complicated part of how a private equity investor manages the portfolio company during the years he holds it is making exitable. And this is sometimes referred to as grooming a portfolio company for exit. And this is achieved by keeping an eye on what the required profile of the company needs to be by the time we reach the exit point and working towards this during the time we hold the portfolio. It should also be borne in mind that the profile may need to be a bit different for a trade sale than for example an IPO. The elements will, that will go into the profile will be the metrics that drive the valuation exit like EBITDA or number of subscribers, the profile of the management team, uh, the level of corporate governance, whether there are, are still acquisition opportunities for the company post-exit. So, for example, a trade buyer may want to parachute their own guy in, as a new CFO. A sovereign wealth fund just wants a full management team. So how you position the portfolio company may vary quite substantially according to who you think or want the buyer or type of exit to be. And this is something that is very often underestimated by private equity fund managers. 
It should be borne in mind that as time passes, the private equity manager may well enter into a dialogue with potential buyers well before the time of exit. And this may inform some of the decisions about the company to make sure that once you get to exit, you're actually selling something that people want to buy. Finally, uh, at the time of exit, the private equity investor will have an exit transaction to manage. It's quite usual for the larger funds to have advisors for this purpose in order to um, have the best transaction and not tie down the private equity team on tasks not related to their primary duties. Smaller funds may manage the transactions themselves or simply with some bare bones assistance in order to save costs. The last point we can make about exits is the relation between exits and fundraising. When a fund manager is fundraising, he is also looking to achieve an exit in his existing fund in order to have a success story to impress his investors, particularly if he's short on exits at that point in time. So this may condition exit decisions a bit, forcing an exit which may be somewhat premature. This is referred to as grandstanding in the private equity industry.